In this video, we shall continue our discussion on Haparin and Warfarin. Now, anticoagulants may be broadly classified into oral anticoagulants, parenteral thrombin inhibitors and others. The oral anticoagulants may be classified into coumarin derivatives, otherwise called the vitamin K antagonists, the orally acting direct inhibitors of thrombin and the orally acting direct 10A inhibitors. Now, the coumarin derivatives or vitamin K antagonists have got warfarin as the most important example. The orally acting direct inhibitors of thrombin has got dabigatran as the example, while orally acting direct 10A inhibitors include edoxaban, apixaban and rivaroxaban. The parental thrombin inhibitors can be classified into two, the indirectly acting parental thrombin inhibitors and the directly acting parental thrombin inhibitors. In the previous discussions, we saw that indirectly acting parental thrombin inhibitors include heparin and its derivatives, which include unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin and fondaparinux. We saw that low molecular weight heparins include tinzaparin, enoxaparin and daltiparin. The directly acting parental thrombin inhibitors include bivalirudin, argatroban, lepirudin, and desirudin. Right. In the previous videos, we discussed in detail regarding the mechanism of action of warfarin. We saw that warfarin inhibits vitamin K epoxide reductase and thereby inhibits the regeneration of the hydroquinone form of vitamin K and therefore it inhibits the uh, functioning of gamma glutamyl carboxylase and ultimately inhibits the activation of factors 2, 7, 9 and 10. Yes. So, when factors 2, 7, 9 and 10 get activated, these activated factors tend to persist in the plasma for three to five days. If we were to administer warfarin, warfarin would inhibit vitamin K epoxide reductase, it would inhibit the regeneration of the hydroquinone form of vitamin K, it would inhibit the proper functioning of gamma glutamyl carboxylase and it would inhibit the activation of factors 2, 7, 9 and 10. What about those factors that have already been activated? Well, they continue to act. They continue to act. Coagulation will continue to occur in spite of giving warfarin until the activated factors are cleared from the plasma. In fact, a pro-coagulant state could, be, could occur uh, during the first one or two days of warfarin therapy and this forms the basis of the delayed onset of action of warfarin. This explains why heparin should always be co-administered with warfarin during the first five days of therapy. Now, how would we establish whether the dose of warfarin that we gave was too low or too high? Well, we would monitor a blood parameter known as the PTINR, the prothrombin time international normalized ratio. So, if we were to start warfarin on a patient, we would start it at a dose of around 2 mg per day. We would of course have to co-administer heparin uh, during the first 5 days. And after 5 days, we would measure the PTINR and if the PTINR falls within certain suitable targets, then we can stop the heparin and continue warfarin. So what would the PTINR have to be for most indications? Well, for most indications, a PTINR of around 2 or 3 is considered to be acceptable. Right. Now, regarding the metabolism of warfarin, it helps to understand that warfarin is a resumic mixture of S enantiomers and R enantiomers. 
The S enantiomer is around five times more potent than the R enantiomer, and therefore the metabolism of the S enantiomer is of greater significance. The S enantiomer of warfarin is metabolized by CYP2C9. The T half of warfarin can vary from around 25 hours to 60 hours, and the duration of action also varies from around 2 to 5 days. Like any other anticoagulant, warfarin can cause uncontrolled bleeding. It is absolutely contraindicated in pregnancy because it can cause congenital deformities in the fetus. Warfarin can cause skin necrosis. Now, the other anticoagulant that we are going to discuss is heparin. And one of the adverse effects of heparin is something called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Now, patients who develop heparin-induced thrombocytopenia should not be given warfarin simply because these patients are more prone to develop warfarin-induced skin necrosis. In fact, they could even end up with gangrene. So warfarin is not an option in patients with heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Right. What should we do if a patient develops toxicity with warfarin? Well, this will be dealt with in much greater detail in toxicology lessons. Uh, but suffice to say that the antidote for warfarin toxicity is a form of vitamin K called vitamin K1 or phytonadione. Okay, so now we move on to heparin. In the previous discussions, we talked in detail about the mechanism of heparin. We said that heparin by itself has no intrinsic anticoagulant activity whatsoever. We also discussed that the liver produces a protein known as antithrombin. And antithrombin can inhibit factor 2A and 10A, but this inhibition is quite insignificant, clinically insignificant. However, when pharmacological doses of heparin are introduced, they greatly enhance the ability of antithrombin to inhibit factor 2A and factor 10A. And this explains the pharmacological basis of the mechanism of action of warfarin. Since warf of heparin, yeah. since heparin has no anticoagulant activity of its own and needs antithrombin to act, heparin is classified as an indirectly acting parenteral thrombin inhibitor. We also discussed that Although heparin is classified as an indirectly acting parenteral thrombin inhibitor, the different forms of heparin inhibit thrombin differently. Unfractionated heparin inhibits thrombin very, very powerfully. Low molecular weight heparin does not inhibit thrombin that powerfully, while Fonda Paradox does not inhibit thrombin at all. On the other hand, all forms of heparin inhibit 10A equally. Now, we need to understand that the basis of the difference in which the different forms of heparin inhibit factor 2A boils down to the concept of scaffolding. Let us assume that this is antithrombin and this is factor 2A, otherwise called thrombin. Now, this is a molecule of unfractionated heparin. It's a very long molecule. Now, when we introduce unfractionated heparin, it forms a complex with antithrombin and it induces a conformational change in antithrombin. Antithrombin is now capable of binding much better to thrombin. Now, in order to inhibit thrombin effectively, Heparin needs to produce a bridge. It needs to produce a bridge across thrombin and antithrombin. This bridge formation, also called scaffolding, effectively inhibits the activity of factor 2A.
Right, so that's how unfractionated a pattern is going to form the cross bridge or scaffolding and effectively inhibit the activity of actor 2A. Now when we consider the activity of low molecular weight apparent, low molecular weight apparent does not have a length as great as that of unfractionated apparent and therefore its ability to form cross bridges or scaffolding is limited and this explains why low molecular weight apparent does not inhibit factor 2A as effectively as unfractionated apparent. Finally, if we consider fond paranux, this is such a short molecule that there is no question of the formation of cross bridges or scaffolding and therefore fond paranux does not inhibit factor 2A at all. Right. When we consider the inhibition of factor 10A by heparin, well, cross bridges are not required, scaffolding is not required. And this is why the different forms of heparin inhibit factor 10A quite equally. Okay, so how do we monitor the therapeutic effect of heparin? Well, once a steady dosage schedule has been established for unfractionated heparin, Daily monitoring is required and this is achieved by monitoring the activated partial thromboplastin time. Low molecular weight apparent needs to be uh, monitored only in certain special circumstances. And now regarding the adverse effects of heparin, just like any other anticoagulant, heparin causes bleeding. In addition to this, it also causes hyperkalemia and hypersensitivity in certain patients. On long-term administration, heparin can cause osteoporosis. In certain patients, it can cause thrombocytopenia. Now, the thrombocytopenia produced by heparin is called heparin-induced thrombocytopenia or HIT. Now, when we talk about patients with thrombocytopenia, the first thing that comes to mind is that this patient is going to suffer from uncontrolled bleeding. Now, in the case of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, we need to understand that heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is a pro-thrombotic state. Okay, so to explain heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, I shall first uh, explain what happens when heparin is given to a normal patient. And then we will see what happens when heparin is given to a patient who is going to develop heparin-induced thrombocytopenia. Now, let us assume that this is a platelet. Platelets contain granules called alpha granules. Alpha granules contain platelet factor 4. Now when platelets are stimulated, these platelets will release platelet factor 4 and some of these platelet factor 4 molecules get attached to the surface of the platelet. Now when we administer this patient heparin, some of the heparin molecules will bind to platelet factor 4 and form a complex. And nothing further happens because this is a normal patient. Heparin will continue its normal functions and that's the end of it. Now, if this patient is someone who is going to develop heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, this unfortunate patient is going to develop antibodies, autoantibodies, that bind to the heparin platelet 4 complex. As you can see, the FC portion of these antibodies are free and they bind to other platelets. And these platelets get activated. And these platelets are going to secrete platelet factor 4. And heparin will bind to the platelet factor 4 attached to these platelets. And more antibodies will bind to these complexes. And as you can imagine, there will be uncontrolled activation of primary hemostasis. When primary hemostasis gets activated, secondary hemostasis also gets activated and a condition occurs where there is uncontrolled clot formation all over the body.
right now a massive number of platelets are used up to produce unnecessary hemostatic plugs when we try to measure the number of platelets in the blood we find that there are very few platelets and this produces a picture of thrombocytopenia so heparin is used to prevent clot formation but in certain patients uh, it can result in a prothrombotic state and this is what we call heparin induced thrombocytopenia now the incidence of heparin induced thrombocytopenia is maximum with unfractionated heparin less in low molecular weight heparin and quite rare with fonda parinux so if a patient is diagnosed with heparin induced thrombocytopenia what do we do obviously we need to stop heparin and then we'd see if the patient is developing prothrombotic features if the patient is developing prothrombotic features we need to administer anticoagulants to these patients the anticoagulants that are preferred for patients with heparin induced thrombocytopenia include bivalirudin argatroban and lepirudin if however the patient does not have thrombotic features then fonda parnux is an acceptable option what we should not do is to transfuse more platelets into this patient and what we should not do is administer warfarin to this patient because as explained earlier in such patients with heparin induced thrombocytopenia warfarin has got a higher predilection to cause skin necrosis and even limb gangrene right we now come to reversal agents for various uh, agents for various anticoagulant agents and other agents so as discussed the reversal agent for warfarin is vitamin k1 or phytonadione the reversal agent for heparin would be something called protamine sulfate protamine sulfate completely reverses the the anticoagulant activity of unfractionated heparin it partially reverses the anticoagulant activity of low molecular weight heparin while it has no activity on the action of fonda parnux remember now that aspirin is an antiplatelet drug it is not an anticoagulant it is an antiplatelet drug there is no specific reversal agent for aspirin thrombolytic agents or fibrinolytic agents like streptokinase and urokinase now the action of these agents can be reversed by the administration of epsilon aminocapric acid and tranexamic acid and finally before i conclude this video i'd just like to uh, show you that these various agents can be monitored by different blood investigations warfarin with uh, uh, ptinr unfractionated heparin with activated partial thromboplastin time and aspirin with bleeding time